so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. It's just after 9 p.m. on the open seas outside San Pedro Marina in LA. And Patrick McDermott and 22 other passengers are on their way to a popular fishing spot off San Clemente Island. It's June 30, 2005, and the group is on an overnight charter. They've been told to bring their own pillows and blankets, and they'll wake up ready to catch some yellowfin or bass when the sun rises. For those keen to be well rested ahead of a big day of fishing, they head straight below deck to their bunks. But the others stay up to enjoy the balmy summer air and some refreshments. Patrick is keen for a laugh. He's lending out kit and cracking jokes with the other men while enjoying a Coke and a hot dog. No one sees him the next day. But his tab, which crew sort out as the boat is coming back into the marina, is fixed up by the time everyone disembarks. Patrick is never heard from again. A few days before the trip, Patrick had parted ways with his on-again, off-again girlfriend of nine years, Olivia Newton-John. His relationship with the Australian actor and singer had been of great interest to the media and the public. Who was this Korean-American cameraman? A seemingly normal, non-celeb, dating one of the biggest stars in the world. But when the media realises it's Olivia's lover that seemingly disappeared at sea, a new whirlwind begins. Did Patrick fall overboard? Was he murdered? Did he take his own life? Or, as has been rumoured for the past 17 years, did he fake his own death to start a completely new life out of the spotlight? I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. Today's episode is about the disappearance of Patrick McDermott. Joining us to discuss the case is investigative journalist and podcaster Poppy Damon, who co-hosts the Case File Presents Suicide podcast with fellow journalist Alice Fines. Their latest season explores the mystery surrounding how Patrick went missing and the many theories about what actually happened to him. I want to start with how Olivia Newton-John and Patrick Kim McDermott actually met. Yeah, so it's really a fascinating story because in 1996, Olivia was shooting a commercial. Uh, She was at peak success. She'd had, you know, the success of Grease and, and other films And she was doing a commercial and Patrick was the cameraman. So, you know, we have to surmise they would have met between takes. Maybe he was setting up her mic or her lighting and they started dating and they were both divorced single parents. They had a lot of common interests, nature, spiritualism. And we really get the sense they really enjoyed each other's company. They kind of kept their relationship a bit under wraps. I mean, it can't be easy dating a a superstar like Olivia Newton-John, but they did manage to keep it kind of private. But we did have some insight of their relationship because Olivia appeared on this show, This Is Your Life. And, you know, obviously the guest gets surprised by lots of different people that they've worked with and people they're in relationships with. And Patrick appears on the show and he gives a very dedicated a heartfelt declaration saying that he loves her so much they've been together eight years at that point and you know they seem really really passionately in love hi darling listen i have one minute to tell you all the things that i want to share with you on this very special evening of yours and first of all just let me start off by saying that you look absolutely stunning and beautiful and i think everybody would agree right <laughs> yeah am i wrong no you're stunning and you're beautiful and your voice is angelic. Your vibrato is mm, perfect. And I'm sorry I can't be there in person to share this wonderful evening with you, but I know you're in good hands with all the people in Oz because they all love you. I love you. The whole world loves you. The animals love you. 
Now let me just say that I've known you for eight wonderful years and you are such a special person. How you can be so compassionate, forgiving, understanding, and gentle. You are the epitome of the uh, word woman. And you have taught me so much about being a better human being and a better person. I've learned so much from you, just hanging around you and watching you and just picking up your essence. You truly are an incredible human being and someone so special to this whole planet. And if we could all just be a little bit like you, we'd all be a little better off. I love you with all my heart. Enjoy this evening, and I'll talk to you later. Bye. We also spoke to a friend of Patrick who says that he did this kind of scavenger hunt in which there was a sort of ring waiting at the end. Whether they were engaged is a little bit contentious, but it certainly seems it was very romantic between the two of them. As you mentioned, Olivia was a superstar. I'm assuming most listeners will know who she is, but she was a singer, an actor. But Patrick, you mentioned that he's quite a private person, but what were you able to discover about his background? Yeah, so Patrick's sort of a very mysterious person in some ways, and that was why it was such an interesting case to delve into. He even had questions himself about his past, and that was because he was born to a Korean mother uh, who named him Kim Jong-nam and a white father. And he was adopted to America around this kind of time of the the post-Korean War, and there was a lot of babies being adopted at that time. And that means that a lot of his past has some mystery around it. In fact, in later years, he and Olivia went to Korea and were trying to find his birth mother. And he sort of was saying he wasn't really getting answers. So there's a lot of mystery about his past, particularly his childhood. We do know that he dropped out of college and then ultimately pursued a career in Hollywood, but behind the scenes. So it seems that Patrick might not have enjoyed the limelight, so to speak, the glitz, the glamour, the red carpets, that kind of thing. But Olivia wasn't actually the first star he dated. Yeah, this was very curious. So Patrick had dated an actor called Yvette Niper, who had starred in things like 21 Jump Street alongside Johnny Depp. And unfortunately, their marriage had ended. They had one son together. And so he was sort of recently single when he dated Olivia. But it seems like he moved in those circles with Hollywood stars, but was definitely a private person who who mostly liked to hold a camera. He worked on a lot of passion projects, including sort of some quite hilarious horror films and sort of personal projects. So he clearly had a passion for Hollywood, but not being in front of the camera. And what was the public perception of Patrick and Olivia's relationship? Yeah, it's a good question. I think we spoke to a lot of fans because we were very interested about what they felt about the relationship. And in some ways, there was always a bit of a a question mark. It's quite unusual, perhaps, for a celebrity to date an ordinary person, especially as she'd had relationships with more high profile people before, other actors and things like that. Certainly after Patrick's disappearance, his relationship with his first wife, his first partner, Yvette Niper, was really gone over a lot in the tabloids. They were very interested in the divorce documents. Again, with both relationships, I think it's hard to make a full judgment because if anyone went looking over your relationship with your ex, I'm sure no one would come off well. So we were always trying to be cautious. (laughs) So, you know, it was alleged it was very acrimonious between Patrick and his first wife. You know, they'd gone through a divorce. They had custody battle as well. But then we spoke to friends who said, you know, he didn't have a bad word to say against her. So it's sometimes hard to work out where the truth lies. But certainly there were people who found it curious that Olivia was with Patrick. However, I will say he was incredibly handsome, charming and funny by all accounts. So I could definitely see what she saw in him. He's a very good looking and likable guy from what we could tell. A lot of the reports mentioned that Patrick and Olivia were quite on and off again. What were you able to find out about that element of their relationship? Yeah, so Olivia does talk about it in her memoir, and she sort of talks about this inability to ever fully commit to Patrick. After he died, she remarried and had obviously married before. They didn't seem to get married. So they seem to have long stretches apart. She has to travel so much for work. She has big stints in Australia. And it seemed this time they'd met up. Allegedly, there'd been a a note exchanged and a bunch of flowers. She then goes to Australia again with her daughter for quite a long stint. So it seems like they were breaking up. We can't know for sure whether that was because she was going away or why it was that they were breaking up. There are a number of private investigators who have various theories and say that they have the answer. And one private investigator claimed it was, you know, that Patrick couldn't deal with the limelight and being Mr. Olivia Newton-John and that that was why he had terminated the relationship this time round. Can you tell me about the letter you just mentioned? There was a love letter that, or a supposed love letter that was given to Olivia from Patrick just before he disappeared? 
That's right. So Philip Klein, this private investigator, says that, you know, Olivia's bodyguard had given him a copy of this and it said, I love you, I'll always love you, but ultimately we have to end things here. We tried to track that letter down. We couldn't. We went to that same bodyguard. They couldn't confirm or deny its existence. So just like many parts of this story, it could be a red herring. And uh, it's very hard to ever hold on to something solid that proves something either way. Timeline-wise, to put everything into perspective, we had the love letter and then Olivia kind of goes back to Australia. How long after that does Patrick go missing? It was all in quite a short time frame. So allegedly the love letter happened a few days before. Olivia got to Australia and had a missed call from Patrick. When she tried to call him back, she couldn't get through. But Patrick wasn't reported missing or noticed to be missing until 10 days after the fishing trip when he didn't show up to a family event. So there's quite a kind of prolonged period before anyone realises he's gone, which is sort of part of the fact that it was in 2005. You think these days, you know, someone doesn't do an Instagram post, you might notice they're not there. But it did take some time for Olivia to realise he was gone. So the day that it's believed that Patrick disappeared is June 30, 2005. Take us through what we know happened that day. So Patrick took a fishing trip with 22 other passengers. He was leaving from a place called San Pedro in LA and he headed out to an island where there's apparently very good fish. Witnesses saw him on board. He was lending out kit, cracking jokes, and he ordered a hot dog that night, which he consumed with a Coca-Cola. That detail obviously becomes important. (laughs) So importantly, no one sees him the next day. So as I mentioned, 10 days pass and he doesn't show up to a family event. And that's when people start to look for him. But by all accounts, everything seemed normal on the fishing trip. Nothing untoward happened. You know, no one noticed an absence. It was just a regular fishing trip. You spoke to some of the people that were on that boat. Did they give you any insights or any suspicions or see his last moments or what would have been his last moments? Yeah. So first of all, what we did was took a timeline of all the accounts we could find to sort of work out who had spoken to him. You know, someone lent him a piece of fishing equipment on the day before. But we really began to be very interested in a particular witness called Casey Clark. And that was because Casey had seen Patrick on prior occasions, which makes him a much more reliable witness. Of course, we know that witness testimony can be problematic if they've seen a picture or seen that person on telly and then their memories get merged. Casey had seen him before. He was a regular on the Freedom Fishing Boat. But also he was quoted as saying that Patrick had made specifically an insurance fraud joke that night. So we tracked Casey down and he gave a very compelling account of what happened that night. He saw Patrick on the boat. He said that he looked more disheveled than the later pictures. He sort of had a scraggly beard and hair. All the pictures we'd seen of Patrick, he looked very well kept. So that was surprising. And his belief was that it was very difficult to be able to abscond from that boat. There's an all night watchman. There's the fact that it's not particularly far out. So it was a pretty fascinating witness to find. Casey questions the boat itself. You have visited the boat. Do you think someone could fall overboard and not be heard from? That's a good question because Casey and many others say, look, this boat's so small, you could just see someone, you'd hear a splash. When we got there, the first thing we noticed was how loud the engine was. And that really changed things for us because as much as it's a small boat, once you don't have the sound of someone out of eye shot, you know, it's possible you could fall off, especially if the boat was moving, which it does. It sort of chunders out to San Clemente Island. So we definitely felt it would be difficult. It's definitely not like a big cruiser where you can imagine someone could just slip off unseen. And certainly the fact that there is an overnight watchman, someone looking out all times does seem strange, but it is possible. Having visited, it's definitely possible someone could have fallen off. Tell me about the hot dog. Why is that (laughs) such a key piece of evidence? (laughs) The hot dog, the hot dog. So... The boat doesn't take a kind of official roll call, but what it does do is you have a tab, you give your passenger number, you can get beers, you can get hot dogs. And then in the morning, as the boat travels back, just before it gets to shore, they get everyone to pay. They call your passenger number and you go up and pay. So a good way to keep some kind of record is that they'll see who paid their tab. Now, the investigator said that he spoke to witnesses. He said they heard Patrick's name be called out. And of course, the document itself was marked as paid. So that hot dog was paid for. So the question is, 
if he was there the next morning, paid for his hot dog, how would it have been that he disappeared or had any kind of accident at sea? It just doesn't make sense. And certainly the marina manager always sort of clung on to that piece of information. He was like, there's no way someone can pay their tab. We're all up on deck. No one's sleeping in the galley. No one's anywhere. You just come straight back to shore. Of course, he could have absconded once he got back to mainland. But if you go with the whole he was using the fishing trip as a way to abscond, it, it just doesn't add up. So we were just trying to look into different theories. Was it someone else paid it? Was it marked mistakenly as paid? It all sort of hinges around the hot dog. It's such an absurd, again, lead. Like there are many in this story. And we saw it repeated so much in tabloids and in different media coverage, sort of, how do you explain the hot dog? Once we get back to shore... In the next few days, I think the most interesting thing to kind of bring to the table is that his belongings are found, his car's found. How long after did all of that happen? And was it just all of his belongings that were found all at once? Yeah. So when Yvette Niper, you know, says that Patrick doesn't turn up to the family event, she calls Frank Liversedge, the marina manager. He goes to Lost Property and finds his wallet and keys and sees that his car is still parked in the parking lot. Now, one detail that we investigate is that it was reported that his passport was also found. Why would you take your passport on a local fishing trip? Again, was it some way of saying, hey, my passport's here, so I've not gone across the border as a sort of decoy? We uncover in the show that there was, in fact, no passport in that lost property. It was just the wallet and keys and sort of those personal items, as well as his bum bag with his sort of fishing tackle and kit in it. So. What's sort of mysterious is that if you follow the theory that he did have some kind of accident, it makes sense. He disappeared and he left all of these items. It's strange in a way that none of them thought it was odd that they had all of these things left behind. Why was no alarm raised? But it certainly provided a lot of confusion and concern for those who loved him because he sort of had vanished. If he wasn't reported missing until 10 days or so after, where does that leave authorities in terms of a search party and that kind of thing? Yeah, so Frank Liversedge, the marina manager, calls the Coast Guard and an investigation begins. And simultaneously, that's when Olivia gets a phone call as well that her ex-boyfriend's missing. And she's advised at that point not to make an appeal for information. But the Coast Guard does issue a kind of public call for any information saying, you know, if you know Patrick, please let us know where you are. We're looking for him and believe him to be missing. So there's a kind of very formal investigation, that Coast Guard goes and interviews witnesses and tries to piece together what's happened. And ultimately, they conclude that he was lost at sea, which is a very broad term to mean that they don't really know what happened, but that he never came back on that boat the next day. And those 10 days, they would have been detrimental to any you know, physical evidence that they might have found in the investigation, right? Absolutely. 10 days in terms of a search or investigation is a very long time. People famously say, you know, the first 24 hours of any missing person is the most important. 10 days, you know, you can't send up helicopters and be looking for someone in the water. You don't have the ability to necessarily have people's memories be really fresh. One thing we were concerned about is even the witnesses that were spoken to, how do they know it was that trip that they saw Patrick on? You know, if you say to someone, what were you doing last week? if you're not keeping a diary, they can kind of blur and significant events like a fishing trip. If you had two very close together, how would you know which was which? So I think that's definitely not helped Patrick's investigation. Those 10 days might explain the continued confusion and misinformation for sure. You mentioned that Olivia was told not to say anything in those initial few days. How quickly did the world's media cotton on to the fact that this was her ex-lover or recently parted lover. Yeah, well, this is one of the fascinating parts of the story because it actually takes until the August for News of the World, which is a big tabloid in the UK, to realise that this is the Patrick McDermott who was dating Olivia Newton-John. And once that splashes as a kind of world exclusive, it just goes bananas. Suddenly, everyone's interested in this story. Suddenly his face is everywhere. And this very private man is the subject of a very public manhunt. So it's a very slow burn, this one, that now has continued for 17 years to fascinate. Did we ever hear from Olivia how she felt in those initial days? Yeah, so she's given, you know, she's often doing sit down interviews and she'll be thrown a question about Patrick and she'll be quite cagey and opaque. But her memoir is pretty candid and she says, 
you know, I really didn't know what to think. You really hope that he is going to show up. I did have people make inquiries in Korea and Mexico. She did everything that she could. And one thing that's very clear is her and Yvette Naipa, his ex-wife, actually became really good friends. And obviously, Olivia passing this year, Yvette was posting you know, sincere condolences for the loss of her friends. So there's a sense that his friends and family really teamed up to really try and work out what had happened. Did this theory that Patrick might have purposely disappeared start early on? Yes. So in that very first news report, we were trying to work out the origin of the suicide theory. That was really important to us. And it's right there in the news of the world story. And what it is, is it's simply that the journalist asks the investigator you know, have you considered that this is a staged death or, you know, and he says something like, we're not ruling anything out. So to us, it doesn't really come from the authorities. It's just that they genuinely don't know. And it, it seems quite a spurious situation. It's not common that someone just vanishes like that. So that's sort of part of the mystery is how that precedes a number of sightings. And they are in Mexico. Many locals say they see him and They are certain they give candid accounts of descriptions of him living on a beach. But that happens later. So that's kind of where this, I'm not going to call it a rumour, where this theory, where Mm. this theory kind of boils over where it's, as you mentioned, this is headline gold. Olivia Newton-John's lover is missing. Perhaps he did it on purpose. And then obviously journalists are just going nuts, trying to find any kind of clue that that could be the theory and you find that they try and nitpick from all these different kind of communities across Mexico. Yeah and I mean the Mexico stuff is complicated because when we started this investigation we thought well is this something where you know a western journalist comes up to someone in Mexico holds up a picture of Patrick and says have you seen him and you ask enough people and someone might say yeah maybe and that sort of turns into it Or are they, you know, are they incentivized by money? I mean, what is the reason for that? And so we start talking to people. And as far as we can tell, lots of the people we speak to, for example, an American who runs a surf camp down there, you know, he believes that he saw him and his gardener believed that he saw him. And what happened was once a journalist hears of this is there's a kind of his camp is descended upon by the world's media. But, you know, witness testimony and that kind of citing it are notoriously tricky. And some of the people we spoke to, their sightings really start to unravel. When asked, they sort of said, I didn't really say I saw him. I said he, I'd heard that he lived around here from the papers. So it's a kind of circular thing. So it's quite complicated. But it's de- we, I mean, we were very willing to go down to Mexico and look for him if we had a solid enough lead. We were on the next plane. So it's a, a bit of a chicken and the egg scenario where you mm. can't work out what's come first. Exactly. For those unaware of the geography here, how close is Mexico from where these fishing trips that Patrick went on take place? Like, why is it assumed that it's Mexico that he ends up in? Yes, very good question. So the Mexican border is just over 100 miles from Los Angeles. So that's pretty close. It's about two hours by car on a good run. And if you think back to 2005, the Mexican border was policed a lot less then. So, you know, you'd be able to sort of cross the border at certain points without necessarily being intercepted. And of course, I think Mexico both realistically has sort of less surveillance than somewhere like America, but also exists in the American fantasy of a kind of wild west. So I guess either theory that you believe, Mexico makes sense. Mexico makes sense as a imagined lawless place where people just have a fantasy that you would run away to. Also beautiful beaches and margaritas. But it also, if you were trying to plan an escape and did want to you know, go onto a large landmass and try and travel unnoticed, it'd be a pretty good spot to go. Are there any real life tangible clues that Patrick might have faked his own death or disappearance? You mentioned on the boat he was joking about life insurance. Was there anything in that? Well, yes, there's a number of really curious clues. And the joke itself, we kind of concluded that Just making a joke about an insurance scam doesn't mean you're making one. And we certainly found no evidence that Patrick benefited financially from his disappearance. But there was, for example, a private investigator who, while looking for Patrick, reported that he received a fax from a lawyer in Mexico that said, this is from Patrick, please leave me alone, I've done nothing wrong. And we should say here that we make season one of suicide and we investigated nine different cases. Faking your own death 
is usually not a criminal action in a particular country. It's all the other fraud and other things that come with it. So if you are making fake documents or, you know, maybe you're, the reason you're faking your own death is because you've committed a crime. But faking your own death isn't actually illegal in most places. So this fact sort of says, leave me alone. I've wanted to start a new life. People walk out on their life all the time, perhaps more than we might think. And so that was a very curious piece of evidence. We did try and contact that law firm. We we went to the private investigator for more information and we couldn't talk to anyone to sort of prove its authenticity. There was also a private investigator who was told by a Mexican bar team that he had left his hat in a bar, that he was traveling with a German woman and that he'd written his name on a sign in the bar, which might seem quite curious behavior for someone who's trying to jump ship and escape the law. But maybe he was, you know, not faking his own death, but just sort of running off. And um, they gave it to the TV network to see if they could test it for his DNA, which would be very definitive. But unfortunately, when we went to the TV network, they said they never they never knew what happened to the hat. It just sort of went to the TV studio and dot, dot, dot. So another dead end. Another dead end. What about Patrick's financial situation? Because there was some interesting detail there. Yeah. So again, this is really fascinating. So the tabloids reported a lot about the fact that he had $8,000 in debt, that he had been back on some child support payments, and that in previous years he'd been declared bankrupt. So we got hold of some primary documents. We were kind of looking at all these financials and all of that stood up. You know, he did seem to have some credit card debt and that kind of thing. But it really raises the question, what is enough debt that would make you do something this extreme? I think all of us you know, splashed out on a credit card. $8,000 is not such an insurmountable sum to most people that you would kind of walk out on your son, your business, your life. But on the other hand, maybe it was just the long-term feeling that you could never quite get out of it. You could never make enough to survive in Hollywood. So that is one of those factors that I think added confusion and motivation for different theorists, you know, divorced, maybe having a bit of a dispute about access to his son, financial problems, does all of those little things that lots of us have in our lives, those complications, add up to a motive to jump ship. As far as we know and as far as you guys found out, he was very dedicated to his son, who would have been, what, 12 when he disappeared? That's right. But again, it can spin either way. If you're so dedicated to your son that you thought you might lose access, might you say, I'm so devastated that I go? Or is that just completely wild and you would just not miss the chance to see your son grow up? His friends certainly did not feel there was any chance he would leave him. And certainly when Chance had his first birthday during the sort of immediate period he was missing, that was a real sign of concern for his family that he would miss his his son's birthday. And I think that what we try and cover in the podcast is this is really painful for those directly involved. You know, it's something we might all kind of take lots of time in thinking about different scenarios. But if you never have an answer, there's a particular form of loss called ambiguous loss where you can't even really grieve because you don't have a body. You can't necessarily have a funeral. And that's something we really considered all the way along. Chance and Yvette didn't want to participate in the podcast. Yvette is bringing out a memoir to give her account. She's not given an interview. And, you know, we'll be really interested to read that. But we respected that and understood that, you know, it might be a very private matter but it must be incredibly hard not knowing what happened to your dad. Especially when it's not something that you can really grieve privately when newspapers and journalists are publishing new things. I mean, still now I see the story pop up in the papers and it's so many years later. Absolutely. And particularly because of Olivia Newton-John passing away this year, there's always going to be that renewed interest in the case until, you know, there could be a definitive answer. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Bath. I'm speaking with investigative journalist and podcaster Poppy Damon about the disappearance of Patrick McDermott. Let's touch on some of the other options to, you know, faking your own death. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The most obvious one being that Patrick was the victim of a tragic accident and he fell overboard. Is that the most plausible answer? Is that what his friends and family think might have happened? Yeah, I think what's confusing is that going to each of them in turn, there's always some pros and some cons. So let's say he had a freak accident, so he could have had a heart attack and fallen off the boat. That's possible, but there was a, you know, a sort of captain and crew who, for safety reasons, always have someone on deck. 
Also, Patrick was really healthy. He exercised. He didn't have any health problems that anyone knew about. We checked with his friends and he could swim. He was also specifically a safety freak. So he worked as a rigger and gaffer and was always the one saying, make sure you've got your you know, safety equipment on. So it seems unlikely he would have been hanging overboard doing something reckless. So the freak accident makes some sense. Maybe it was just the moment someone wasn't looking and, you know, he hit his head, something swang. I mean, something could have happened like that, but that does seem strange again. And no one noticed lots of men on the boat, fishing, drinking, no one sees anything. Then of course, there's the possibility of foul play or murder. Now, his friend actually presented this theory to us. And he said, well, on the pros of that theory, Patrick was quite quick to temper. If he felt something was unjust, he could kind of get up in someone's face and say, hey, you know, that's not cool. And he said, you know, could that have happened? A fight gone wrong? And then someone panics, he gets disposed of. That's again possible. But could two people have a big brawl on a fishing boat with a load of guys and no one hear anything or intervene? That seems unlikely too. And then finally, there's the possibility of a suicide. So for me personally, I think we can really easily fall into the trap of saying, because lots of friends and family said, well, you know, he wasn't suicidal and he was very spiritual. I don't know that we could just decide based on someone's temperament. I think we can never know what's in someone's heart in that instance. But I think for me, it's very unlikely because it's a very odd way to take your own life, to go on a fishing excursion with lots of witnesses and then sort of go into the ocean, even though you can swim. It doesn't seem a very logical way to take your own life. So I think we can rule, well, not rule out, but I would say suicide and foul play are both fairly unlikely. So that kind of leaves us with those two options, that he did either fake his own death or he was the victim of a tragic accident. I think that's right. You know, Alice and I conclude that we can think of him as dead. As close as you can be sure someone's dead, we can in Patrick's case, because really we haven't got any concrete sighting where someone's for sure seen him or has a photograph or laid their hands upon him, you know, for 18 years. And it would be pretty hard to do that in the modern world. You know, someone was able to get a picture of him, it'd be worth a lot of money. The name of your podcast, obviously being Suicide, you've looked into this area a lot. You've done multiple stories in this kind of space. Is this not as uncommon as we think it is? Yeah, it's kind of amazing because a lot of people know the case of the canoe man, which has been turned on a TV program here. But there was a man called John Darwin who faked his own death to get his life insurance policy. And he was living in his attic with his wife, knowing in on the scheme. He didn't even tell his own sons that he'd done this plot, which seems so extraordinary that you would put your family through that suffering. So there was kind of interest in those sort of faked deaths, I suppose. But we found countless stories with such different motivations. There was a man who faked his own death because his wife had a hit out on him. And the police said to him, unless you fake your own death, we're not sure that we can prove that she really would have followed through with the hit and no one's going to convict a lovely seeming housewife. So they staged the death alongside the police. We cover a story of a nun who fakes her own death to be able to escape the convent. You know, there's sort of these amazing stories through history. And certainly there's a financial reasons that people continue to fake their own death to this day. In 2022, though, how do you remain missing when we are so interconnected? Well, you know, again, I don't think it's as impossible as you might think, because I think if you're somewhere where you don't need documentation or if you're able to obtain fake documentation, that's very possible. Changing your appearance is easier than ever. Plastic surgery or, you know, donning a disguise. And really, you know, there are 7 billion people on the planet. So if you really massively change your location over time, it is it is possible to disappear still. What made you want to look into this case in particular? Was there something that intrigued you the most? Yeah, for me, this story is a conventional mystery. It has all the elements of a sort of caper of intrigue, but it's also a story about fame, celebrity and misinformation and tabloid culture, how, you know, little details that are misprinted or incorrect suddenly spread and cause more theories on Reddit and more conspiracy. And we really wanted to just get to the bottom and try and lay out what we do know, even though there's lots we can't prove either way. We just wanted to separate the fact from fiction. And that really intrigued me. And as I say, I think just that trying to understand their relationship and think about 
that mega stardom next to an ordinary guy and what that must have been like for their relationship and what it did to their life, really. I mean, we wouldn't maybe be talking about Patrick if he hadn't dated Olivia Newton-John. To me, when I, you know, listened to you and your co-host trying to track down these clues and then finding dead ends and then going down another route, it reminds me of like Chinese whispers but on like a global stage (laughs) because it just feels like you can never unravel what's happened because it's 20 years down the track and it just feels so convoluted. It's definitely not a conventional true crime podcast in some ways because we just really like sort of share the journey and we do put everything on there even when it is a dead end. I think that there are things and revelations that we are able to get to. So as you say, there's some things that are just impossible and so hard. But another classic thing we pursue is lots of people say, well, his body would have been found. Lots of people say this is impossible that someone could vanish because he's so close to shore, you'd have a body, definite. But we spoke to all these scientists and, you know, technology has advanced so much now. You can trace the waves and the weather and the currents and work out what could have happened. And we go down this amazing avenue where we realize it's actually totally possible that a body, especially when no alarm has been called, could disappear, essentially be swallowed by the sea, swept out by currents, stuck under a rock. You know, it's amazing now how much we can know about decomposition and the possibility of truly vanishing at sea. So do you think that there is a chance that we will one day find out what happened to Patrick? I do. I mean, I think we have to accept that it may be one of those forever mysteries, but you never know. There could be a small item that washes up on shore or someone who does come forward and say they did see something. I think you can never rule out having complete answers. Thanks to Poppy for assisting us to tell this story. If you'd like to hear her full investigation into Patrick's disappearance, you can find a link for her podcast, Case File Presents Pseudocide, in our show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Gemma Barth, with audio design by Rhiannon Mooney. The executive producer is Gia Moylan. Thanks for listening. I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation.